Hey guys, Corey from Aquarium Co-op here, and today Jimmy asked me to tell some crazy stories. And so I thought there's no better spot to tell a crazy story than in the fish store since I, I essentially lived here for three years straight, my life before YouTube. And a lot of crazy things happened. We almost went out of business a couple of times. You know, there was many nights like this, like right now it's 9.30 at night that I would have been legitimately at the store. Someone would ask me to stay late so they could shop or something like that. And, uh, you know, I'd be drinking brownie root beer, like I always have. Like, this has been a staple in the shop for almost since, like, year one. You know, after that first year, we got that soda machine, and we've had it ever since, so. The story I'm going to tell today is one of the times we almost went out of business. It's a kind of a long, stressful story, I guess. At the time, we were probably... So we had hit our first year, and it was in January. So this would have been, now the store's been open, this is its sixth January, so six years. So this would have been the second January, or month number 13. At that point, we'd had a little bit of money. You know, we probably had maybe $10,000 in the bank, which if you've never had a business, seems like a lot. If you have a business, you know like that's not very much money at all, especially for an entire fish store, right? So at that point we had to go and we would have to get, um, we'd go get fish, but we were so tight on money we would hand pick them. Every Tetra, we wouldn't like, you know, get every Tetra, but we'd go, oh, these look healthy, we'll buy them. Oh, there's goldfish, oh, we'll buy that specific goldfish. And we would do that, we'd go to the wholesalers. But because I only had one employee, Lamont at the time, we'd have to get here early to go do that. So we would get here like eight o'clock in the morning, store didn't open till noon. So we could get to somewhere, shop for a few hours, get back, race back here, get them unloaded into quarantine, and then serve the public. And so it was one of these mornings that we were on our way here that I woke up, I was getting ready to take a shower, and I noticed that our, our Murphy camera, then at the time, Hank camera, uh, I'd lost power. And that happens from time to time. You go, okay, yeah, power's out, or internet's out, something weird's going on, okay. But then I was done showering, and I'm getting ready to come here, and it still wasn't back on. I'm like, wow, it's really out. So then it's like, oh, maybe we're not gonna go fish shopping today because power's out. Like, it doesn't make sense to go buy fish if you know your power's already out. And then, so I'm about halfway here, and Lamont sends me a picture of, of basically the store. He says, the windows are all fogged up. And I go, huh. All right, well, you know, I'm 15 minutes away. Figure it out when we get there. And then, like, three or four minutes later, he sends me another text, and he says, like, I think the exact words are, it's effed. Like, the entire... And I was like, well, what do you mean? And then he showed me a picture, and the front of the store, we had a 340-gallon tank, had burst. And there was just dead bodies and sand and rocks and everything everywhere like literally you know we're, we're 50 feet from front to back there was dead bodies even in the bathroom like it was that much carnage and so he said I think Hank's still alive and so he was trying to move him and he was like trying to find a net and all that kind of stuff I show up Hank was already in this tank behind me over here in the 75 upside down not breathing um, and that was the first time in my life when I could ever sympathize with the, I guess the words of, I couldn't think. I always thought to that point, people just say that. That was the first time in my life where there had ever been so much stress that I was having trouble comprehending thoughts. And for a guy that doesn't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any of like that stuff because I hate not being in control of my mind that was very scary to me and so I didn't even know where to start what to do like Hank was either gonna die or he was dead and so the first thing that we were thinking about was like uh, where's the water right because there's there's water and sand that's just like this thick in the entire place and so I think at the very first we were starting to see there's a couple flopping fish still so we'd go and rescue those and we threw them into a tank and then it dawned on me, oh my god, did the water go anywhere? So we go outside the door, we go next door, 
on right behind the camera there is a tattoo shop. Water's everywhere. And so I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna get sued. What are we gonna do? Water's everywhere. And so then we walk to the next space over to this way. And we don't see any water because we couldn't really see into the thing, but we come in, we look, and there's water against the wall. We're like, there's gotta be water in there. And so we try to call both businesses, but it's at this point, it's about eight o'clock in the morning. And no one's picking up their phone and I don't know what to do like I can't vacuum it up we've got a shop vac what can we do though the water and you can watch the water creeping more because it's seeping through the walls and I don't know what to do so the only thing we could think of is like we need to call one of those like water companies like oh what is that thing called like a, a restoration company uh, an emergency company like what is it so we, we google it and we get a number and we call it and so I'm explaining the situation like okay a fish tank exploded my retail store there's water and sand everywhere when can you guys be out and their response was like well we're pretty full this week so maybe sometime next week I'm like no 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 you don't get it the water is everywhere and they're like yeah we know uh, we kind of come in and we clean up afterwards and so here I am in a mode trying to stop everything from going getting worse right because what if I've got two businesses next to me that are flooded. What if it's going to more businesses? It's not there yet, but how do I stop it? I can't even get into those buildings to stop it. And so the only I call one more, and they're like, the, they don't pick up, and I'm like, I, this is not working. This is not. We're not. We're 20 minutes in. We're no closer to fixing this problem. So I call the guy that built the store, and I go, Can you just come here? I don't know. I don't know what to do right now. I I I, I don't know what to do. You know, and he's like, what, what do you, what, what's going on? You know, because 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, the store's flooded. Water's everywhere. It's, it's the, the 340 gallon tank, it's exploded. And I said, just bring, I, I don't know, bring a shop back. It, what, come down here, you know. So I call my wife, same thing. And I'm like, just grab anything. I don't know, fans, I guess. We're going to try dry it out. And, and, and our shop back, get, come down here, please. You know, and I think she had to call and work sick. And then I was like, Okay, so we've got one shop back, Lamont, uh, start picking up bodies. That was the next thing, like pick up these bodies, put them in a bag, put them in the freezer, I guess, I don't know. And then vacuum up the sand. We gotta get the sand up if we gotta get the water up. And so I was like, I'm gonna go to Home Depot and see if I can buy a shop back or uh, maybe we can rent one of those rug doctors. And so I, I go over there, mean, like, meanwhile, I'm just losing my mind. Because people, all the people I've called are still asking questions like, what, should I, should I do this? Like, what about, I'm not going to be able to get there till now, like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I just get here, right? And so I get in, and of course, there's like, it's a skeleton crew at Home Depot, and I'm like, look, I just need to rent a rug doctor. And they were like, well, you know, i, I, I got to find the guy with the key for the rug doctor thing. And I'm like, yeah, great, go find him. And they're like trying to upsell me the whole time of like, well, you know, this shampoo's better. I'm like, no, you don't get it. I just, I just need to get out of here. Yes, whatever it costs, doesn't matter. Like at the time, the only vehicle I had was a, a little sporty hatchback. So then I'm like lugging this thing into the back of my two seater and I get back here and we start cleaning up. Some people start arriving and like the whole time I'm losing my mind because no matter what we can do in here, like, the the businesses next door are still flooded. And they could sue me, they could, like, I've got insurance on this place, but I have no idea does it even cover them. I know the tattoo shops have got appointments, right? Like, and I can't get a hold of anyone. So finally, the floral people next to me land. Well, not land, but they get here, and they, like, they didn't poke their head in or anything and at that point we had like a bunch of stuff like everything that was on the floor had to go out because you've got sand and dead bodies like tetras and dead stuff behind everything every book not bookcase but shelf all that stuff and you had anything that was on the ground got ruined we had canister filters the boxes are ruined all that stuff was just out and we were loading up the back of a van at that point and uh, i think andy the guy that built the store was cutting apart the tank the tank originally had taken six or seven people to lift in and now the back panel had exploded and it moved the tank three feet off the wall and there was stuff stuck behind it 
and it was too heavy that no one could move it, and we were afraid if we picked it up, would it shatter because it didn't have the support of the back brace anymore? So we were cutting it apart, and still the panels were heavy, so he was working on that. We're trying to clean up. They finally pop over, and they were like, uh, yeah, there's water over here, and I'm like, yes, I'm so sorry. Like, this, top, this tank exploded, and there's water everywhere, and like... Uh, how, how bad is it over there? And they're like, well, come look. And so I go over there and I look, and it's it's like half their thing. Luckily, there's concrete, and they're kind of a floral place, so it doesn't seem that bad. You know, and I'm like, well, I can, I can, I, uh, should, we, should we clean it up? And they're like, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and get a shop back and clean it up, and uh, yeah, just clean it up. And I was like, so is there like anything damaged or you know like and she's like no i don't think so you know it's just like some flowers and stuff and i think if you just clean it up really well i'll move a little bit of stuff it'll be all right and so i get some people from over here we go over there and we're just cleaning it as fast as we can i've never sweat so much in my life i'm still like feel like i'm gonna puke i haven't eaten all day and it's like just get that clean as fast as you can you know and just get that water out of there let's you know put this fire out um so we're, we're doing that, and I think at the same time, a tattoo shop comes. And they see that it's clearly just chaos outside. There's stuff everywhere. So at this time, the, the tattoo shop also opened at noon. So at this time, customers are starting to show up, and they're like, Hey, what's going on in there? And we're like, Oh, man, yeah, tank blew out. Can I see? Like, we're like, no, can't really let the public in. And then you'd have nice customers like, can, can I help? And it's like, well, we don't really have any more things you can do. Really, all you can do is kind of just stay out. We don't know how long we're going to have to be closed or anything like that. Sorry, you made the trip. And so the tattoo shop arrives, and I'm like, I know there's water in there. And, uh, like, I, I, I'll clean it up. And they're like, yep, you got to clean that up. You know, and they're not happy. They're definitely not happy, but they're not super pissed either. They like I was expecting like screaming or something. Like I don't know what I was expecting. I was expecting the worst. So we get over there with a shop back. They've got like a mop, and uh, so we get up all the water. And it luckily wasn't horrible over there. Like the building was sloped a little bit, so most of the excess water went that way, and not too much over there. And I think I lucked out that the owner wasn't there. It was like one of the tattoo artists, so they were a little bit cooler than the person who owned it. They mopped it up, and then they, like, put bleach all over the floor and sterilized it. And I don't know if they took appointments that day. They might have. I, I, or they might have been close. I have no idea because I was so, like, in my own what-am-I-going-to-do mode over here that once they kind of let me off the hook, I was like, okay, back to the destruction site. And at the same time, I'm going, oh, my God, do I got to call insurance? If I call insurance... All the drywall that got wet, they're going to want to cut out. And if they cut that out, that means they got to take the tanks out. And if I take the tanks out, we're not open for business. And if they take six weeks to do this, for sure I'm done. Like that just... So I kind of I kind of go, okay, uh, i got to go talk to these people again. And i got to go ask them, like, do I have to, like, are, are we okay here? Do I need to call insurance? Like, is this, like, I don't want to get sued, so I should call insurance if it's going to be a thing. And the floral person's like, no, don't worry about it. Like, I don't think anything of mine got ruined or anything like that. And then I go over to the tattoo shop, and they're like, I don't know, man. It seems like it's all right. You know, like, I can't speak for the owner, but it seems like it's going to be okay. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to call insurance because I know they'll only make this scenario worse for me. And so we get everything out, the stuff that we can't put out. Well, no, we, we did get everything out. So then... We're vacuuming everything. We get as much water as we can. It's so humid in here. And by that time, it's like 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I start sending people home. And that night, I stay late. My wife and I and maybe Lamont as well, I believe he stayed really late. And we put down baking soda over the entire carpet that we had. And then we vacuumed that up, trying to make sure that we're not going to have like a smell left over. And... Again, trying to get as much water as we can up, because then we would we would pull it up with uh, the rug doctor and all that kind of stuff. And then we had to move everything back in, right? I think so. Maybe we had to move the stuff back in and then put the baking soda down because 
all the, the shelving and everything couldn't stay outside. People would just steal it. So I had to come back in, but we had to put it up on blocks because we didn't want it to sit on the carpet with mold. And so we do, we bring that in, we get that ready, and then we just have to go home. And it's like this, okay, so what I, that was a Thursday. So then Friday, we're not open to the public because everything's still damaged. It's still super humid and wet. And it just was one of those things like we can't open. It just, it's too risky. Like it's not ready. There's still, we're still finding bodies and just stuff. And so then we're closed Friday and that costs us lots of money. Friday's a big sales day. And then, oh yeah. So that same night on, on, on Friday morning, I think, I knew I had to get commercial grade equipment. So we, I was scouring Craigslist all night. Friday morning, I go and I buy some used commercial dehumidifier. I bought one because that's all I could afford. It was $500, I think. Yeah, I think. And then I also bought carpet blowers from Home Depot, just a big giant fan. That was another $500. That's $1,000 I couldn't really give up, but at the same time, couldn't call insurance, and that wasn't going to happen either. But first, I called to rent them. I remember the day before, we were calling around trying to find them. I couldn't even find them to rent. So that was a problem. And each one was like, it was like $250 for the day or 350 bucks for the week. And I was like, oh my God, that's that's so much money. One day is $250, but I guess they know like you don't need it for that many days. And so I ended up buying one knowing that like if I ever needed it again in the future, I'd have one off Craigslist. And then I had to buy the carpet blowers from Home Depot. We got that going, so it's a tornado in here. And we still had to get it dry though because we had everything up on that's why we couldn't have people i was like why couldn't we have people i i needed to make money everything was still up on stilts and all it took is one of those things falling over and killing someone or anything like that that's why people couldn't be in here we weren't dry yet and so yeah so then saturday rolls around still can't still can't let people in saturday night we start taking stuff off stilts. It's it's pretty much dry. It's not a hundred percent dry, and we know like we got to get open. Like every day that goes by on this weekend, we're probably losing two to three thousand dollars in sales. Well, maybe at that point it's like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars in sales. And I know that the tank exploding, which we had to take that that went to the guy that built the place's house and sat there for a long time. It's so that stand. Okay, you guys will know this. That stand is the rosewood stand that's carved out of dragons and all that that's in my living room right now. That's the reason I rebuilt that tank is because I wasn't going to let that tank beat me. And by clawing back out of that, buying that tank was like, it was one of the hardest things, hardest things ever to get back out of. And I remember in that same month, I think there was less than $2,000 in the bank account because we had missed out on all the sales, we had lost product, we had to buy equipment, there was still payroll for the employees, like all that stuff was happening. I wasn't even paying myself at that point. And that was that was the point where I'm like, I don't know if we're gonna make it through this. I honestly don't know if we'll make it through this. This is like power bills coming, there's all these things coming and I don't know, like I can't, I can't take money from home because we didn't have any money. Like that money, we were already leveraged as much as we could be. I hadn't brought a pay, paycheck home in probably 18 months. My wife was working, but that was keeping the home going. And yeah, I think I my employees took a couple of days off to help, you know, like, okay, well, yeah. You know, I didn't have to pay them for like Saturday, that Friday and Saturday because we were closed. And I just remember being so stressed and depressed going, what am I going to do? Like. We were doing so well. We had we had made it. We were on the like the one year mark, you know. And what can we do? And there, I was like, there's nothing I can do. There's just nothing else to do but wait. And so the one part of the story that I had forgotten to this point is like by Saturday, or no, by by Thursday night, Hank was alive. So he had like kind of rioted. Like well, no, he was breathing. Come, we came back Friday morning and he was upright. Did not look good at all, right? But was upright and by, oh, well, and Friday he was like puffing up. That's a real stress thing going on. And it was trying to get out of the tank and thrashing. But then that 75 gallon tank was the biggest tank in the store. Like, and we didn't want a chance moving him and killing him. 
and that kind of stuff. He'd been through a lot. He was out of the water for like, I think when we look back on it, like over an hour, you know, assuming that it popped and all the water came out at the same time. And so we didn't want to chance that. And, you know, by golly, he made it through it. Like, I cannot believe this day, because there was giant boulders, which you've probably seen in the pictures by now, that were outside that tank, but he remained in the tank, and there was no way to get behind that tank. If he had gone back there, he just would have died. We had, It took hours. Later in the day, we were finally able to get back behind that, because it's too dangerous to crawl over, anything like that. So, unfortunately, the fish that you probably saw in the pictures by now, they were all dead. The wild-caught angelfish, the roseline sharks, the rainbows, the, the you know, we'd put... I think a hundred rummy nose, a hundred neon or black neon tetras, a hundred like uh, lemon tetras. All that stuff was pretty much just dead. There was so little left, and it was it was like it was almost like your uh, your emotions just shut down. Like it's so horrible. You're under so much stress. You might have lost like it's like you're losing your dog because my my fish like that are like my dog, and uh, you know like it just was really hard, and so. It's almost like I had to block it out. And then, so then, like Sunday comes, and we're just packed. Everyone wants to know what happens. You're telling the story, you're telling the story, you're telling the story, you're telling the story. Yeah, people are buying stuff, you're telling the story. And we, we managed to claw our way out, you know, of just like the hardest thing, maybe the hardest thing I've ever been through, you know. And then, like, I want to say it was six or eight months later, Hank, the Mabu Puffer that was just as big as Murphy, got sick. And for whatever reason, we couldn't figure it out. Like, no matter what I did, I couldn't make him better. He had stopped eating, and that's a bad sign with the Puffers. And, like, he was getting more sick as each week went by. More people would be like, what's wrong with him? He's not coming up to eat. You know, he's not. He's kind of just sitting there. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really sure. And so then I we ended up taking him home. And at that point, he still wouldn't eat. A few days later, he like started to roll over, and like I knew that wasn't good. And he still, you know, just would not eat. He'd look at you, you know, kind of like a sick dog will look at you and go like, "Are you gonna help?" And so I thought maybe it was a swim bladder. So I remember late at night, you know, we were. This was when we were uh, at the second like house we were renting, and um, like I remember laying on the couch. It's choking me up, sorry. Because uh, I couldn't help him. And so I felt horrible, and I was researching, like, what can I do? I'd reached out to uh, Dr. Tim Miller Morgan, which I've been sharing on Facebook lately. And uh, he was the only guy that knew about puffers, like, really knew about them. Like, how do you actually solve a puffer problem? And uh, at the time... So it was January, right? And like, I know it's January right now, and I know he's in Peru. And he goes to Peru every year, but at the time I had no idea. And so everywhere I asked, I was asking like Washington State University, I was asking anyone I could, any vet, and they all would point back to Dr. Tim Miller Morgan's the guy that can help you. And he's in the middle of the the jungle with no contact, and I can't get a hold of him, like no matter what I do. And so, like, I know I've got all the store people wondering what's happening at home. I still got to go to work the next day. There's all those kinds of things going on. And so, like, I feel like the only thing left I can do is try to, like, I read about arowanas and how sometimes they flip. It's a swim bladder problem, and maybe that could help. And so you have to do what's called, like, uh, aspirating the swim bladder. And so I had to get a big needle... And you have to like go in right at the lateral line, so that's like right, right above like the stomach area, and without like a, an anatomy book on Mabu puffers, like you're kind of guessing. And at that point, like I had to go to Walmart because it was the only store open. It's late at night, and I was like, I'm sure, I'm sure he's gonna die. And so, like, I went to the pharmacy, and then they were like, I can't give you a needle. You know, because they were, like, thinking I was a druggie or something, I guess. So I finally convinced them. And, like, the only one they have is, like, not even that big. Like, I don't even know if it's long enough. And it's not a very big diameter, but I convinced them to give me a needle. And so I go home, and, like, it's barely holding on. 
and like I grab him and I stab him with it. You can tell he doesn't like it. But it's like your dog, man. What do you do? So I get some air to come out. I finally found his bladder, swim bladder. It took like four times, which still feels so bad. Because it didn't fix him. Like there was nothing we could do. And he was only getting worse. I stayed up with him and basically watched him die. And like, we were trying to save him. And I thought, if he can live to the morning, no matter what happens, I'll drive him across the state and get him to like Washington State University or Wazoo. Because they at least had a, uh, like a, and like a fish program for like, they would study catfish and like salmon diseases so like when a, a big farm got a disease that's killing everything they would analyze it they could harvest the organs and that kind of stuff but he didn't make it to the morning so like you know at four six or something i don't even know when it was he just wasn't alive anymore it was hard on me it was hard on katie my wife and i remember loading him up in a cooler and talking to a vet tech that kind of knew how to preserve the organs because I was calling stores, or not stores, but vets in the morning and uh, they were like, well, you know, get it in the fridge, try to preserve any of the organs because at that point I just want to know like what killed them, what I do wrong, you know? Like how am I going to explain this to thousands of customers that had come to see him every day, like that kind of stuff. And uh, so I brought Hank, you know, he's this big, and we brought him in, and I brought him to the store, and the vet tech came and got him, and they harvested the organs and did a necropsy, and we found that there was like a bunch of legion, lesions on like his heart and his spleen, um, and we were able to confirm that it was a male, because they're not sexable until, well, ever, so like, it could have been a girl the whole time official length was 22 inches and like that day I still had to work at the store kind of a train wreck situation you know um, and then it was the worst part of it was reliving that story and telling it to the public every day for like six months because like a lot of customers would just come in every three months or something right and they'd be like oh where's Hank and so I'd have to like tell him the whole story of how he passed away and everything and you know, meanwhile, like before he passed away, kids were making like get well soon card, get well soon cards and stuff for him, and you know, like all this stuff. So it was really hard to deal with, and I didn't have a Moo Boo puffer for a long time, and you know, so it was like that was all in the same year. I'm pretty sure, or at least within it's within 12 months. It was it was really hard to keep going on. You know, like. You lose your favorite fish, kind of your mascot you had before the store, and like everyone knew it. Everyone wanted to know what I was going to do with it, you know. And I went through that phase where I got like a, I think a platinum marijuana and stuff because you just don't want to replace. It's like when you lose your dog, you don't want to just you don't want another dog because it's too hard, right? It took a couple years before I bought more Boo Boo Puffers, and now we have Murphy. And every day I'm terrified that something's going to happen to him because. Like, I can only imagine what it would be like when, like, when he passed away and you guys have watched millions of people have seen him at this point. And, you know, I'll feel like I failed. And, you know, the story's kind of getting jumbled up. But, like, we did find out with the organs being looked at and everything that there was nothing I could do. He was free of every parasite that a normal Aquarius would ever get. It was actually, I think... Like, there's a, there was debate in the medical books whether the thing that caused the lesions was 
fungal or bacterial, but there's no known cure. Uh, when it gets into a salmon farm, it, the, the answer is sterilize the entire farm, kill all the stock, do all those things. And so he was clean from everything a hobbyist could have done, and there was nothing I could have done at all. You know, so it, it made me feel a little bit better knowing that I didn't have to tell people like, oh, it turns out I had internal tapeworms or something like that, and I killed him. And from like that point on, that's where I started like attending classes on diseases and that kind of stuff with Dr. Tim Miller Morgan. I was like, I need to, I need to get more educated. I need to make sure this can never happen again. Even though it was something, it was because all Mabu puffers are wild caught. So he had already had it before I ever got him. And it was just kind of like that ticking time bomb. And that disease was more uh, aggressive in colder water. So it typically would only affect like salmon and that kind of stuff, and it's really quick and kills them while they're young. But because we were keeping them warmer in a tropical temperature, it took way longer to manifest to tax his organs and stuff enough. So what had happened is kind of just like slow, long death, like cancer or something. And we just kept taxing his system until, you know, like his heart couldn't pump and that kind of stuff. Like, it's horrible. So, you know, I guess those are some of the stories that are hard to, you know, I've, I've told that story kind of a real... Not the death of Hank, but like the tank exploding when I've given talks before, like owning a fish store, what's that like? What's that like? And, uh, you know, so it hasn't always been easy kind of as a YouTube career, you know, like not getting paid, losing something like that from the public, almost going out of business. And like, I'm super thankful now that the business is doing well, like my dreams are coming true and the fact that I have employees that can actually retire from here if they want they have a retirement they have all these good things but you know I try to always show the positive side of what we do you know because I don't I don't know that it like is a good thing to show death and the bad sides of the hobby but you know that's a story that you know I knew I would tell someday but I knew it'd be hard you know and as I as you saw here it was pretty hard to tell and I'm not like I'm not sad I told the story. I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to tell it again. And so, like, do me a favor, I guess. Don't ask the story, that story to be told again, like on a live stream or something like that. Like, clearly, it still hurts, you know? So, you know, all I can say is, you know, I miss Hank. He's you say? He's my best friend. Still miss him every day. And even though I have puffers to replace him, he'll never be my first one. And he helped me through a lot of hard times at the store, give me the willpower to like work that hard. You know, and I don't want to make it seem like my wife wasn't helping me. She was there, totally supportive, you know, but still alive, you know, and I'm just appreciative for her, but it's hard to talk about something you lost, so, yeah, that's the story of Hank, and uh, almost going out of business a couple times, it was really hard to move on after that, you know, it's a dark place when every day you gotta relive it, you know, and you're not making much money, and sometimes you just think, yeah, maybe I should just uh, do something else, so, trying to get my bearings back. So in this freezer, Hank is here. We've I've kept him, you know, and people, I've mentioned that and they're like, that's pretty weird, you know, but like you can see how much it meant to me. You know, and it's maybe it's a little morbid that we keep it with all the clams that kind of feeds Murphy and all that, but. So there's a couple of things here. I'll tell you a story. Two, another story, I guess. But here he is. This is Hank. He's in this box. You know, we saved him because we're going to bury him under a tree. We've got this maple you may have seen in the pond. And we talk about how we're going to decorate the pond and everything. And we've, we were moving houses and I didn't want to leave Hank behind with burying them under a tree. And so when we bought this house, we knew 
I had to build this pond. I had to set the the maple tree, and we're gonna put them underneath it. You know, and I I think I had I had said that in a live stream one time. I was gonna bury him, and uh, there was a woman that met me. I think it was two years ago at the Aquatic Experience, and she you know, came up to me and was like, oh man, I heard the story of like how you lost a puffer and I lost one too. And so she was, she had driven to, uh, at that time I was in what, Chicago, I think? And she had lost a Mabu puffer and she didn't know what to do with it. And that's this Mabu puffer right here. She drove it cross country and it's been here now for probably like three or four months, you know, so it took a long time to get out here, but we're going to bury this one with, um, with Hank, because it's one of those things, like, she didn't know what to do either, you know, like, these fish are so personable that you just, you don't want to let them go, you know, you don't want to just throw them out, but, so we do have those two puffers, and they've been here, and once it kind of thaws out from the winter, the goal is to plant, I guess, plant them, you know, like, so from then ever on, it's like, oh, that big maple tree, that becomes Hank, you know, use this life that died to start it. It's kind of corny, you know, but I just want to remember him, you know, and I don't want to keep him in a freezer and we hire new employees and people are like, what are these? You know, it's kind of weird explaining like those are my, you know, my most prized fish, you know, that I've ever had, you know, like that was Murphy 1.0, you know, I even, I hesitate to even say that because that's not justice to him, but, you know, so one day you guys will see that and you'll be in the know when I plant that. You know, maybe I've, I do a pond tour and you see the maple and you'll know. We, we plan it. You'll you'll know the backstory where, you know, not everyone will know it. Like, you know, I don't know if I'm ready to tell that story for the main channel or something like that. But Jimmy asked, you know, about kind of some of those struggles that, you know, he gets, you know, he, he hears it every once in a while. You know, but usually I go, yeah, you know, it was really hard when Hank died type of deal. And uh, as I was just telling him between walking over here, it's like, it's so hard to explain how someone how i say someone like that's how how something dies you know it's like if let's say you had a you know had an aunt that passed away from cancer it's like it's easy to say that until you're like well could you lay out exactly all the steps on how horrible that was and then it's like brings back all the emotions so you know like that's pretty important chapter in my life still with us gonna stay with us forever you know my wife feels the exact same way i do about that fish you know that that fish like launched me into a runny nose and crying so much. Launched me into like kind of opening a store and wanting to teach people and all that kind of stuff. You know, while I was healthy and it was just so cool. I wanted to teach everyone that they could keep these big fish with very small fish and teach ecosystems and all that. And he allowed me to do that for many years. Well, not many years because he was probably only about five, I think, at that point. But yeah. There's the story. That's the, probably the rawest I've ever been with anyone. So I hope it was worth watching.